Okay, so hello, hello, welcome, welcome. This is the uh, Climate Emergency Centre Wednesday night uh, Zoom meeting and talk. Uh, tonight we have the, uh, the, the uh, fantastic and the infamous uh, Rupert Reed, who is coming uh, with a fantastic new video we're really excited about with uh, very uh, well produced with Franny Armstrong, I think. Um, and Rupert's uh, coming to talk to us at a very auspicious time, obviously COP27 going on. Some of us have activists been active since the 1992 Rio Earth Summit and uh, we feel our government's been copying out for 27 years. But uh, I think Rupert's going to talk to us about that and transforming things from the bottom up. So without much too much further ado, I'll pass over to Rupert for a bit of an intro and then the video. Rupert, welcome. Thank you very much for coming and talking. Over. Uh, Phoenix, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here at the Climate Emergency Centre's network. So, yeah, uh, a word about this video. If you haven't yet seen it, but prepared to have your socks blown off. Uh, it's only two minutes. I made it with Franny Armstrong, the maker of The Age of Stupid and the, actually much of The Age of Stupid team. Uh, we had a, a budget of only £10,000. I hope you'll agree that we've done a pretty good job for that. Uh, so this is our film called Out of the Ashes. Uh, Phoenix, are you able to queue it up and start it off? Yep, we're just, uh, let's share there. And tell me, you can, can you see that? Yep. Uh, press play on the action. The shopping mall. Your home. My home. Jeff Bezos' multiple homes. All we've created. Everyone we love. Everyone yet to be born. London, Paris, New York, Melbourne, Mecca, Mumbai. Everywhere and everyone is now on the climate front line. We put too much pressure on the living systems on which we depend. The house of cards started to fall. So, like so many before it, our civilization is unraveling. Yes, we could have prevented this had we acted decisively decades ago. No doubt the reason why we didn't will be debated in future by students and law courts. There are any. What we can still control, to an extent, is how hard the landing is. How many people survive? How many other species get taken out? What parts of the globe remain habitable? If we dare. Do we dare to accept that we, the most intelligent species ever to have evolved, have made the most colossal mistake in all geological time? Do we dare to turn and face the unimaginable horror as it overwhelms our friends and neighbors here and abroad? and maybe, of course, ourselves. I think we do. I think we can decide to put our energies, our intelligence, and our famous human spirit into ensuring that the ending of this civilization is as transformational as possible. Let's save as many people. Let's restore as many habitats. Let's rebuild what's worth rebuilding. And while we're doing so, let's collectively rethink what it's all about so that if we get another chance, we can do things much, much better. Ashes are now inevitable. What grows out of them? Well, that's all to play for. Okay, so everyone saw that. It was a fantastic uh, Franny Armstrong uh, and Rupert and a whole host you saw there at the end. Absolutely brilliant, Rupert. Love it. The uh, end is only beginning coming from another door, is not phrase. So over to Rupert. Take it away. Thank well, you. thanks, Phoenix. And if, like me, you, you were watching that in a somewhat staccato fashion, and if you haven't seen it before, then do uh, uh, watch afterwards uh, in, uh, in uh, normal... Um, speed. I think you'll appreciate it even more. I've put the link in the chat there. And obviously, that's a, a super appropriate way to begin. Um, consider, for example, the line that I used towards the end, the ending of this civilization needs to be as transformational as possible. So my claim for se several years now has been that it is inevitable that this civilization will come to an end uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, and if we try to prolong it, uh, beyond um, a short period of time, that ending will be more terminal. Whereas there is a chance of ending this civilization without collapse uh, if we do it in a deliberate transformational fashion. Uh, and I'll come back to that point. 
but I hope that that's a good frame to be having in our minds as we start out this little talk I'm going to give you here this evening about, well, as I put it in the title, as COP27 fails us, how we turn to bottom-up transformation by saying a couple of words about COP27. So COP27, um, some good things happening so far. Uh, it's good that loss and damage is on the agenda. This is really important for Global South countries. Uh, it doesn't mean that any money is going to get to them anytime soon, but there is a chance now that they'll get some money from that by about 2024, uh, which is much needed. Another good development in these opening days has been the major new initiative, which uh, the UN Secretary General has just been talking about, about trying to do something about greenwashing by trying to have a kind of a structure, an agreed um, system for the meaning of um, commitments that companies make to net zero targets, for example. Uh, and it may be that uh, this helps us to finally get a, a bit of a handle on the massive amount of greenwashing that's going on. Uh, and this could be important for the building of uh, what I'm calling um, a mass moderate flank, uh, which I'll return to shortly. So some good things happening out of COP, out of COP um, and hopefully there'll be more. But let's be very clear, the chances of COP27 saving us are about the same as the chances of uh, Donald Trump converting to uh, Buddhism and saying, um, you know, I'm terribly sorry, there weren't any election regularities and so forth. It could happen, but don't hold your breath. Um, this system, this COP system, is designed to fail. If you are interested to know more about what I mean by that, we could discuss it. Um, or you can read my piece that I just put on uh, Medium um, a couple of days ago, uh, where I, I explain what this claim means. The, the, the COP system was not designed to succeed in the kind of way that the Montreal Protocol uh, on um, uh, ozone depleting substances was designed to succeed and did succeed. Um, COP does not have the same structure as that. The UNFCCC does not have the same structure of that as that. Uh, it's essentially primarily a voluntary architecture. And to expect um, the nations of the world, uh, let alone the companies of the world, uh, to do the right thing on an essentially a voluntary basis uh, is, well, it's absurd. COP27 is definitely going to fail us, even if they come up with quite a good PR job by the end of this fortnight. And what that means is we have to be ready to pick up the slack. Uh, no one is riding to the rescue. We are not going to stay within the safe zone. The 1.5 degree limit for maximum global overheat is going to be passed. This is something I've been warning for some time. Some of you may have heard me saying this before. Uh, the chorus is growing. So here, my first prop this week's Economist. See the cover there? The Economist are, are calling it, you know, the in-house journal of capitalism is saying, say goodbye to 1.5 degrees. Now, their narrative of what that means is not a great one, and it's not our narrative. Uh, we need to make sure that as 1.5 degrees, as the relatively safe planet that we have known goes into the rear view mirror, that our narrative gets more prominence and that it gets um, acted upon. So we are not going to stay in the safe zone, but that is still not really being admitted by most people at COP. So there's this growing kind of gap, a, a gulf really opening up between um, what the political leaders are saying and what still some scientists are saying on the one hand, and some campaigners, of course, very well-meaning campaigners, um, and reality on the other hand. And it is beyond horrific that we are going to crash through the 1.5 degree centigrade barrier within the next uh, several years. And that's, of course, why so many of us have been campaigning so hard to stay below 1.5 degrees, because it is basically a planetary boundary and the consequences of crashing through it are going to be terrible. But it is going to happen and we need to face up to that. Um, if there was going to be any chance of us not going through 1.5, massive changes would have had to have started to happen several years ago. One, one could just about imagine, for example, that if Extinction Rebellion had fully succeeded in its aims around the world in 2018 to 2019, say by about 2020, then we might still be able to credibly think about staying below 1.5. But of course, nothing even remotely like that has, has happened. XR had an extraordinary unprecedented effect in terms of consciousness raising and creating a new space 
Um, but there hasn't been uh, a worldwide revolution in practices which has resulted in suddenly the emissions curve being bent drastically, rapidly down. That's what staying below 1.5 would require. So it's not going to happen. So this is the truth. This is the bitter truth that we have to reconcile ourselves with, because if we don't, we're not in any kind of position to, to act intelligently. And um, here's my second prop. If you want more information about this, then I'm proud to be able to show you my new book. And this is a sneak preek. This is a sneak preview. Um, uh, this isn't actually out until Monday, but I've got a, a rushed initial copy through the mail. This is, do you want to know the truth? Uh, the surprising rewards of climate honesty. So, you know, hopefully the idea is a little bit intuitive to you if you know anything about my work or if you've understood what I've been saying in the, in the first five or so minutes of this talk. When we reconcile ourselves with the truth, then it becomes possible to, to act strategically and intelligently and moreover, to be rocket fueled by the horror of that truth. Right. Uh, this is the this is the, the secret, really, uh, of what we managed to achieve in Extinction Rebellion and what Greta managed to achieve and so on, that we brought a truth to the situation, a willingness to name it um, bluntly that just hadn't been there before. Uh, and our facing climate reality gave us a kind of power and authenticity and a willingness to break through barriers that hadn't been there before. And that's what we, that's the furrow that we need to continue to plow and to plow all the harder as we reach this this terrible epochal moment of realizing that our governments have categorically failed us, uh, that we are moving into a hot new world that is going to be beyond the safe limit of 1.5 degrees, the maximum amount that was agreed uh, as the, the limit that we should, that we had to hold to in terms of average um, global uh, surface temperatures. So that's the context in which we need to be very clear that COP is not going to save us, that they have, that governments and the international system has categorically failed us. We could talk about what the alternatives are. We could talk about how, for example, the COP system should be reformed or replaced. I'm very happy to have that conversation. As I say, I make a start on talking about this in this piece on Medium the other day, which you can read if you wish, but I'm not gonna say more about that in this talk, just because the gravity of the failure and the gravity of the situation is so much that we have to be thinking at least as much about how to build resilience, about how to defend ourselves together, about how to start to model a society that could come out of whatever ashes there are going to be, as we do about reforming and working within the existing system. So that's really the motivation behind the, the title of my talk uh, here this evening. As COP27 fails us, how we turn to bottom up uh, transformation. So without further ado, as it were, for the remainder of my remarks, I'm gonna turn directly to that topic. And I'm going to begin with uh, climate emergency centres. Uh, it really is a great pleasure to be speaking to this network. This is a very important phenomenon that is growing in this country uh, and to some extent uh, around the world. This is part of the, the great kind of flowering of post-XR post -XR, um, activities that have gone on of people trying to reckon with the situation that we're in and trying to do something which is really constructive uh, in response to it. Now, I don't need to tell you what climate emergency centres are and and uh, what what the, why they matter and so on. You all know that more uh, more intimately, I'm sure, than I do. But I simply wanted to remark that from where I sit and in this context of seeing um, what's gone wrong with the world, how we've been let down, etc., climate emergency centres are a really important symbol, and they're they're much more than that. They're a really important emerging reality. Now, what broader context would I place them in? Well, I've already given you a broad hint there. Um, I see climate emergency centers as one part of this kind of immense flowering that is occurring in the post XR landscape. Some of this flowering comes directly from within uh, XR, and that is true of climate emergency centers. So Phoenix and I, for example, uh, first got to know each other properly um, um, back in uh, uh, late 2018, uh, early 2019 as XR uh, was beginning. And I know that a number of you on this call have been very active um, in XR. The post XR flowering though, as I called it a moment ago, is much broader than that in the sense that it also includes a lot of people who are not in XR, but who have been affected 
by the consciousness shift, by the widening of the Overton window that XR and the youth climate strikers achieved basically by punching a hole through the consensus uh, in 2019 and by showing that another way of doing um, protest, another way of, well, rebelling uh, was possible. Um, so what this post XR flowering involves is a lot of people who are in XR and a lot of people, probably even many more people who are not um, in XR nor in the climate strikes, but, but who have been empowered and enabled by that change that occurred uh, in 2019. So I could talk about um, many other examples uh, of this. I'm happy to do so. I don't plan to do so particularly here with you uh, this evening, but I'm happy to do so in response to questions. But I'm going to give this phenomenon um, an overall name. Many of you will be already familiar with this name. I call it the new moderate flank. Now, some people are not very happy with this word moderate. I understand that. Uh, some of us haven't really particularly uh, appreciated moderates, let alone being identified as uh, moderates during our uh, activist careers or whatever. Um, just say a couple of things about that. Firstly, this term moderate, as I use it, is intended to be relative to the radical flank that XR self-consciously uh, represented. Um, and what, it, what I intend it to mean in that sense is that there is something which is more uh, welcoming and open and easy and accessible to all of the elements of this new distributed, it's very widely distributed, uh, emerging moderate flank than was the case in the radical flank that we were in, um, many of us together, um, in 2018, 2019, uh, 2020. Um, it is... Um, easier to be part of an organization which is not determinedly outside the law um, as XR uh, was. Um, it is easier to uh, to get involved with something which doesn't set such um, somewhat high um, thresholds or barriers to, uh, to, to entry or to a kind of um, sense of full involvement. Um, that's part of what I mean by using the term moderate. The second point I would make is um, it doesn't really matter what we think about this term. What matters is how this term works for people who are not necessarily uh, that much like us, but are part of the much broader group who we are trying to appeal to. Because that is part, that is a critical part. Of, sorry, someone's got their mic on. If they could turn it off, please, I'd be most grateful. <laughs> um, that is a part, that is a critical part um, of, um, of what we're trying to achieve. If we're trying to achieve this kind of bottom-up transformation, there have to be a lot of people involved, a hell of a lot of people, a hell of a lot more people than were, than were actually involved in XR, or even than were actually involved in the school climate strikes. Millions were involved in that. We need tens of millions. We need hundreds of billions, ultimately, if we're going to have a chance of getting through uh, what is coming that was hinted at in my little film uh, that we watched uh, earlier. Yeah? We need truly mass involvement. The Overton window has been moved by the radical flank. We need to have a far larger number of people willing to actually, as it were, march through uh, that enlarged window. So it's, so it's a mass phenomenon that we need. And in order for that to be the case, an awful lot of those people are not gonna be comfortable identifying as radicals. They're much more comfortable identifying as, well, ordinary mainstream people, moderates. And we should include in that people whose politics, for example, we don't agree with. Uh, we should be really serious about that. XR talked about that, but maybe XR wasn't always really serious about being beyond party politics or beyond ideology. Uh, we should be serious about that. We should reach out to small C conservative people, for example, who are wanting to build local resilience, who care about uh, having reliable local food supplies, who want to cover every aspect of the climate and ecological more than emergency in their uh, lives. And there are quite a lot of such people now and there are more all the time. And there will be more all the time as this very, very difficult uh, decade unfolds. So that's part of what I mean by talking about a mass uh, moderate flank. And the final point I'd make about this term moderate relative to the term radical is that if you're interested in drilling down into this more, then I'd recommend you to read my essay in Perspectiva if you haven't done so, which is called What Next on Climate? the need for a new moderate flank. And the final part of that essay, the uh, the postscript, is called Why the Moderate Flank is More Radical Than the Radical Flank. 
Uh, and I think a number of you here might find that quite interesting if you're interested in what I'm talking about in, in this aspect of it. Um, there are some ways in which the kind of thing that we're trying to do when we do things like climate emergency centers uh, and the other aspects of, uh, of, the, uh, of the new moderate flank across our communities, across our workplaces, there are some ways in which that, that mode of acting is arguably more radical than the so-called radical flank. For example, by being radically inclusive. For example, by being not about demanding something of others, but about constructing something um, ourselves. Uh, and there are other ways that we could talk about and that I talk about in that postscript to that essay. Um, okay, so this is what I'm talking about when I talk about a mass moderate flank. And this is this is an overall frame for hoping, hoping to make sense of what is happening and what is bound to grow in the coming years, because there are certain to be more people wanting to be involved in climate activism in the 2020s, as the situation continues to worsen. And there are certain to be far more people who want to get involved in climate action, but who don't necessarily think of themselves as activists and don't want to think of themselves as activists. And again, this is part of how we need to lower barriers to entry. We need to make sure that in places like climate emergency centers and wherever in our workplaces, in our institutions, uh, where we pray, where we live, whatever it is, wherever we're trying to build this mass moderate flank, whatever part of that game we're involved in, we need to make sure that we are welcoming in uh, people who are not comfortable uh, in uh, a space which is uh, um, branded or labeled as an activist space. That's another thing that some of us may find challenging, but it's another thing that we will do if we're really serious about getting masses of the general public, masses of ordinary citizens involved. And that's what we need to do. Okay, um, there's one more thing I want to uh, talk about, and then I'm gonna uh, bring my remarks to uh, a close and uh, hand over to Jules, who's gonna say some things uh, about um, uh, how this mass moderate flank um, can be seen um, in what's happening uh, in localities, in geographic communities, on the ground, uh, and how that uh, intersects or overlaps with um, uh, with uh, climate emergency centres. And that's to bring in the, another concept that some of you will be familiar with, including from my work, which is the concept of transformative adaptation. So part of the implications of this of the way in which we are um, out of the safe zone. Uh, it's already 2032 in a certain sense, if you see what I mean. Uh, we are going to, to crash through the 1.5 barrier. <coughs> Part of the implication of this is that we have to adapt. We have to build resilience. We have no choice. Um, to some extent, adapting is not gonna be possible probably, but we have to try, we have to do it to our, to our utmost. Now, what form should this adaptation take? To the extent that the adaptation is shallow, defensive, incremental adaptation, to the extent that it involves things like building higher um, seawalls, trying to keep the, the, the rising waters out, to put it both metaphorically and literally, to that extent it is going to fail, it's going to be, it's going to fragilize us further, and it's going to be just a further prolongation of the, of the useless failing system uh, that we're in. We need to work with nature, not against nature. We need to mitigate at the same time as we uh, adapt. We need to try to build and prefigure and actualize the transformed um, society uh, that we want to see. Um, we need to, to act to transform uh, what there is while we still have time. In short, we need transformative uh, adaptation. This is an overall frame for what we need to do to our civilization and what we need to do in response to the climate more than emergency. You'll notice I keep using this phrase, more than emergency, because it is more than an emergency. An emergency is something you can imagine coming to an end and the emergency is, uh, is, is over and we've sorted it. That is never gonna happen, right? With this, that's never gonna happen. The most that we can hope for is to kind of tame the situation and kind of find ways of rolling with it. So it's more than uh, an emergency. I'm not suggesting you rename the network climate more than emergency centers. That's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, it's a it's a kind of quite important technical or philosophical point, if you will, and one I'm happy to happy to discuss. So in this climate more than emergency, this climate and ecological more than emergency, an actually central aspect of what we need to do is transformatively adapt. Climate emergency centers are one facet of that, and it is crucial that CECs 
uh, in my opinion, be at least as much about adaptation as about a mitigation. Transformative adaptation brings those two things together. It interlocks them. Um, and it is, as I see it, also part of this uh, emerging um, new uh, moderate flank. It's a part of this post-XR flowering. It's a part of what we need to do and what we will do and what we are doing um, to get through what's coming. Uh, and it's beautiful and exciting. And that takes me to Jules. So Jules Thompson is known to some of you. Uh, he's given a talk here before. I think he's going to put the link in the chat for that talk in case any of you uh, missed it. Um, and Jules is now working very closely with us in the uh, in the new moderate flank in the outfit that uh, that, that I run, which is called the uh, the moderate flank incubator. Uh, we will be launching formally later this month. Look out for that. Um, and Jules is going to be responsible for heading up the community climate action aspect of the new moderate flank. And this obviously is absolutely crucial, absolutely essential to everything that we've been talking about here and obviously um, closely related uh, to uh, what CECs are about. Um, and uh, obviously a manifestation um, of the transformative adaptation that I was just describing. So that's the end of my remarks. I'm now going to hand over to Jules, who's going to talk for just three or four minutes uh, about community climate action, about what we're trying to do uh, in this sphere under this kind of overall heading of building a new moderate flank. Uh, and hopefully that will give you uh, a slightly more concrete sense, if what I've said so far hasn't been sufficiently concrete, of how uh, we can see um, this um, that I've been talking about as a kind of uh, joined up um, emerging, exciting form of bottom-up uh, transformation. And after Jules has spoken, then I'll hand over to uh, to Phoenix to uh, to chair us as we have uh, Q and A and discussion. So, Jules, welcome, and uh, uh, give us a give us a couple of minutes on uh, what I just described. Thanks, thanks, Rupert. As always, um, a compelling call to action and a vision of a future of emergence, maybe from the ashes as we face the reality that one and a half is dead and that the UN has declared code red for humanity and has said there is no pathway to 1.5 and we are on the highway to climate hell so what do we what do we do how do we live with that how do we hold that in ourselves and in our communities what do, what do we do right now um and in discussions with Rupert, um, some of you may have already seen the talk I did about iFarm on our Community Benefit Society in Norfolk, which is already part of the Climate Emergency Centre. I certainly recognise some people on this call that were, that were there and the links in the chat so you can see a little bit more about what we're doing. But really it's to galvanise planning in our communities by giving it a, giving it a name. It's Community Climate Action and it's a community climate action plan. And so we've got some small scale funding from the National Lottery to write a plan for our three parishes in a very conservative Brexit voting area. And if we can do it here, we can do it anywhere. You know, it's not universally popular. We got, we got it through our parish council on Monday night for one of the villages by three votes to two. Um, and we start to plan and we start to really consider as a community what the next decade will look like for us and how we grow community resilience. How we um, challenge planning that's um, inconsistent with the climate and ecological emergency and move towards net zero and sequestering carbon and perhaps perhaps the, the, the vision and great hope of actually sequestering carbon and returning this to a place of safety by, by putting it into homes. Um, by installing smart energy microgrids and making sure we have access to water and food. I mean, it's really some basics. Um, while doing that, we um, create infrastructure that's consistent with the, with the climate and ecological emergency, and hopefully we increase biodiversity. And by activating our communities in this fashion, we have an opportunity through that process to just to tell the truth, to level with them, well, level with us, stop lying. We are, this is the reality of the situation that we're in. And we'll be doing that through community engagement, um, through participatory politics. So fundamentally, the government's not gonna come and come and save us anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Imagine XR as the tip of the spear and maybe participatory politics and community action as the other corners of, those tri of that triangle. Currently, there's a bit of a void. 
And if we don't fill that void, then the Daily Mail fills that void with a hair shirt future. So we're going to talk about, you know, in our communities about how we build that resilience and create, create as far as we can abundance and mitigate these terrible effects and the consequences of the next decade, at least. And we're starting in Suffolk and East Anglia, and we're lucky enough to have a, a county council that has a, a, a world beating net zero target of 2030. So how do we support our local authority in delivering this? Where does the money come from? All of those kind of questions, you know. So how do we, as a as civil society, it's our civic duty, uh, you know, imagine if we were facing the invasion of uh, Poland and a, and a world at war, what's our civic duty? And our civic duty here in what, councils are recognizing having declared climate emergency and having their own targets and plans is they can't do it without a mass mobilization of civil society so all of us here have a place-based enterprise that's a climate emergency center um so i'm here to support and, and help and uh, foster a, 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 um uh groups of people to go out and do in their in their communities and i know lots of lots of people in this network that's um uh, really remarkable to behold are already going and doing great things so how you know how do we build on that um there was a question in chat about people you know about deliberative democracy this kind of thing you know we can we can facilitate holding that deliberative democracy in our local governments um so <clears throat> a really good example of the of the i think i believe the success so far of um the moderate flank was um, Radio 4 today with um, Indigo from Just Stop Oil, I think, and Rupert from the moderate flank being the talking heads. Mm -hmm. And two years ago, that would have been XR and maybe a climate denialist from Global Warming Policy Foundation or Taxpayers Alliance. So already it's moved to be to being, you know, to be more over here talking about the best way um, to address this crisis as opposed to denialism so you know we for community climate action it's all about how we get into our communities and facilitate that discussion for us to actually take action and i'm, I'm delighted to be here again and and working with rupert and then and seeing you all again so thanks okay. jules that's brilliant that's that's us i hope that gives you a sense of uh, uh what i was hoping to bring here this evening and of what jules has just beautifully added there and let's throw it open to questions phoenix okay lovely jubbly thank you very much rupert and jules uh definitely a lot of food for thought there particularly as we're now at the uh, cop 27 time in egypt um just to say the climate emergency centers network has kind of come through 30 years of uh environmental community center action our particular group started at the rio earth summit when we realized that there wasn't enough being done by governments even though 179 governments agreed to do something um you know and it really does need grassroots community action and we found through setting up these centers for 30 years that many different groups come through and get involved and create alliances and we need to build that infrastructure for transformation for a sustainable future and really we really need to be focusing on the solutions and we we, we have all seen a lot of these and there's a lot of talk about what we don't want and we need to carry on protesting against that but we really need to put a lot of energy more into what we do want the renewables the solutions the community the infrastructure so without too much further ado um if you would like to speak um you can do the old-fashioned raising your hand uh but it helps me facilitate if you can down at the bottom of the screen there's a little reactions thing little smiley face and you click on that and raise your hand and then lower your hand when you've finished uh that helps us see who's one two three so if you've got a question pop your hand up i think going over to diner in sunny lewis is it over diner nice to see you again over uh unmute Hi there. Hi. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Dino, we've got a problem. Problem with your audio, um, maybe. Yeah. Well, and yeah. lots of people don't know. Can don't you know. close your video? There might be. Yeah. A yeah. Turn your before. video off. Bottom left. Yeah, if you close the video, we'll hear better, possibly. Over. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Much Is that better. better? 
Okay, yes. thank you. Uh, where, where, where we live in Lewis, we've got a good council on side, but the problem is, no matter what we do, we have this problem with uh, this basically fascist government. And the trouble is, um, there's no way of getting them out. This is today with Nick Robinson. It is a quarter to nine now. They're throwing tomato soup at a Van Gogh mashed potato at a model. I don't know what's happened. Sorry. Uh, but, um, Carry on, Donna. Yeah, yeah, so, like, although um, it's not our role to dictate to people how to vote, I think most people in this country don't know anything about our electoral system. And in our climate emergency centre, um, I feel quite strongly that we should push for electoral reform and education about democracy. I, I really love participatory democracy myself, but I know that it hasn't got a chance in hell with the situation we've got. It won't get anywhere unless we can actually change the electoral system so that PR is involved. And then if we had that, we could actually really move with deliberative, uh, with, uh, deliberative uh, democracy in that. But we can't at the moment because they're just shutting everything down. So do you think that community uh, climate emergency centres could be places for educating people about our political system and what to do about it, how to change it? Uh, what an interesting uh, question. Um, complex, and I don't know if Phoenix might want to say something brief about this as well, but let me make I'd an... I'd briefly say they're about system change. We need to change this whole system and part of our democratic, yeah. economic and environmental system massively needs to change. But over to Rupert. Yeah, I mean, clearly democracy needs to be radically upgraded, right? Um, XR was absolutely right about that. Uh, and Jules gestured at that in his remarks about uh, deliberative democracy and bottom-up democracy. Um, I think it's 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 challenging how to go about doing it, partly because it's such a, a huge task, partly because you need to be uh, careful to do it in a way which, as you said, Diner, is kind of educative rather than kind of polemical and ideological, which will put off some of the very people you want to get involved, like people who might vote conservative, for example. Um, so I think it's uh, it's it's challenging to how to go about doing it, but by all means, let's have a go at, at doing it in in subtle ways. Now, a really important point I would add to that is um, let's think about what might happen at the next election. So we've got this crap electoral system, but even so, it's uh, almost certain, in my opinion, that the Conservatives will lose the next election. Now, you don't recover from this kind of economic fuck up, massive clusterfuck that they've. Uh, had in the last few months. Um, so we're, the next government will probably be headed by uh, Keir Starmer. It might be a Labour overall majority government. Uh, in my opinion, it's more likely to be some kind of uh, coalition or confidence and supply or something like that, uh, involving maybe SNP, maybe Lib Dems, Greens even. Um, what is this government going to do, uh, this next government? There's lots of nice green words coming out of uh, Keir Starmer's uh, mouth at the moment, um, just lately. Um, but I would say to you, if you're kind of thinking um, the next government will be um, a lot better than this government, it might be. But, you know, being uh, punched is a lot better than being um, uh, attacked with a knife. It's still not great. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, what the next government does is in no way going to be sufficient onto the scale of the situation. Uh, there is no possibility of that. If we had electoral reform, um, and uh, which is you know, possible now, it's conceivable, uh, the, there's a lot of sentiment in the Labour Party in favour of PR now, let alone obviously the Lib Dems and the Greens and so on. If we had electoral reform, would that improve the situation? Yes, it would improve the situation. We would have more Greens in Parliament, for example. Would a government that was elected with electoral reform put forward a sufficiently radical, a sufficiently bold, a sufficiently realistic, a sufficiently truth-based agenda? Still, absolutely not. There's still no way that it would. Um, it would just be like being uh, kicked rather than knifed or, you know, you can carry on the analogy um, for yourselves. Um, we have to make sure that we do everything we possibly can um, within our means to uh, improve democracy to make it realer to uh, change the system we also have to be realistic that um, those changes are difficult and that they are unlikely to be sufficient 
so that means it seems to me that even if we succeed in getting um, electoral uh, reform, for example, um, that's still not a full upgrading of democracy, and in no way will it be sufficient. Um, so there will there's there's a continued case for um, for the for the action of the of the moderate flank for for trad for uh, climate emergency, emergency centres etc. Whatever the next government is. Uh, Rupert, just a quick technical point. I've been asked to mute all because there was a bit of sound in the background. I just want to make sure that doesn't mute you as well. Once yeah, well, I can unmute, I think. I can unmute, I can unmute all. Okay. All right. Did you finish that one? I think Julian's got a question. Over there. Uh, thanks, uh, Rupert. Great. A um, couple of quick ways. Uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned at the beginning uh, not being like Montreal. How do you make it more like Montreal? And the second question is, um, uh, you talked about well we do do need to get these masses of people on side and um to do that we need to talk to the people that sort of agree with us probably not the daily mail readers um and uh but we need to massively sort of broaden that church and what do you think are the most effective ways of broadening the people that we're talking to yeah so thank you julian a couple of good questions on the first question so there is the link in the chat to my piece in medium um, briefly, um, what is what would be needed in a in a cop style system that actually worked would be for there to be um, legal sanctions built into the system, uh, trade sanctions, for instance, which was part of what's there in the Montreal Protocol and not there in the UNFCCC or in the um, uh, in the cop system. Um, and uh, actually, I'll, I, in a moment, I'll put another um, uh, link in the chat where I talk about uh, building an alternative uh, to the COP system from uh, the independent. Um, on your second question, well, I hope I've already said some things uh, in response to that question. Uh, I'll hand over to Jules, actually, who's got some really good experience uh, on this to, to make a, a remark in a second. Um, I would just say um, that we do have to be serious uh, about um, welcoming people in whose politics are not necessarily our own. And some of them may even be Daily Mail readers, you know. Uh, it's interesting that the, the Mail is a, is a horrendous uh, paper in many ways, uh, but actually um, it does have some good investigative journalism in it. Um, it has um, quite a few, uh, quite a lot of articles with really good content uh, online. Um, often they have terrible headlines. One thing that's really important to understand about the media, by the way, is that in the press, um, journalists don't write their own headlines and nor do opinion writers. So, for example, uh, people often come to me and say, Rupert, I really didn't like that, that uh, the title you used for that article you wrote in The Independent or something. And the reply is always, I didn't write the title. <laughs> the editors write the titles as, as clickbait, right? So quite often in the mail online, the titles are horrible. But you read the actual article and it's mostly just fine. It's mostly OK. It's mostly just reportage. Um, anyway, so I'm saying that even Daily Mail readers are not beyond the pale um, there. You know, I live in the countryside now uh, and Jules spends a lot of his time in the in the countryside. Jules, tell us a little bit about your experience there. Thanks. Thanks, Rupert. So, Dina, just to respond to your about democracy. Yeah, voting is voting is a direct action. Yeah, we should all vote. And getting the vote out and getting the younger vote out in a, such a disillusioned society is one of the critical times in terms of having a voice heard. Um, and I think our best chance of getting a government that was mo would be most sympathetic to our plight in terms of climate and ecological emergency is passed with the Corbyn Act, and many of us were involved with. And with the label that, that um, Rupert has name checked is the difference between being punched or stabbed really at moment. Um, we've got to take it into our communities. And in terms of the question about how do we get other, uh, others involved? Well, where I am right now, I am ideologically opposed or would have been, I consider myself probably ideologically opposed to many of the audience and counselors that I'm both working with and speaking to in that they're conservatives. They are conservative voters and I'm never change their mind about that. However, through a process of engagement, um, we can take the isms out. 
and there's more that connects than divides. And they and the farmers that have traditionally voted conservative or vote conservative, I'm not going to change their mind about that. But they read they do recognise that we've had a massive drought this summer. They do see a change in the seasons, and they in intrinsically know something is very badly wrong. Mm. But they don't quite know what to do. So they're part of that part of that 61% that want to do something but don't know what to do. Equally, um, what I've done personally is I've gone and joined our parish council. And if you told me pre-pandemic that would be a parish council, I would have laughed at you. Um, and so I've joined, you know, I've joined our conservative parish council and I'm working with our conservative district and our conservative county councillor that have both declared emergency. So when I stand up and say, you know, say my bit, um, you know, it's in support of the marvellous targets and I must applaud the action of our Conservative councillors that have declared emergency. Um, so we really focus on what connects and, you know, there, there are some very deeply conservative organisations like CPRE, Council for Protection of Rural England, um, the RSPB National Trust that also recognise what a uh, terrible systemic emergency we have. So from my perspective, that's, the, that's, my, that's my audience. You know, is those deep, those uh, you know probably very very blue through and through audience that equally care deeply about our lived in our natural environment, um, you know, and uh, the ecology that surrounds us, particularly in a rural area in a, in, a, in a farming. So really, it's about for me, it's two things. One is thinking about what connects, you know, our needs and our values, and connecting from a value perspective rather than fighting about ideologies and the second is, while I appreciate small-scale deliberative democracy people's assemblies on a village basis aren't gonna be massive systems change it's a way of inter introducing people to deliberative democracy so that they you know they go oh wow this this feel this feels good and um, we're hoping that it will then grow from there so it's a, as a movement we grassroots ground up and it will be doing what we say on the tin and practicing it in our in our communities and hopefully that will that will influence and the one good bit particularly good bit of news that we've got on that is we've having these conversations with our district council and um, our which is breckland district council which is in norfolk they've said well that's a good idea how about we have a a quarterly climate forum and how about we hold it in the committee offices in the council so they're actually giving us where they, you know, the, the auditorium with the microphones where they make their decisions for the community and stakeholders that we're mapping to come together and have a quarterly climate forum with the outcomes then helping both inform and deliver um, local authority policy. So it's, a, it's an example where grassroots potentially, you know, we're planting seeds, so potentially yeah, grassroots democracy can flourish. Imagine if we all did this in our local authorities. Um, you know, and there's Jules, a lot. Uh, Jules, you, you just uh, succinct a little end because we've got a couple more questions before the end on timing. Always full of brilliant info. Uh, just want to finish that, Isam. That was it. Thanks, Phil. Okay. All right. So, so what's to say that just, just basically, I know we've got a couple more questions and we've got about eight minutes to finish. That's why I'm bringing in the facilitation there just a little bit. I know Rupert might have to uh, go closer to the end. Um, but what was to say, you know, this it really is about cooperation across the spectrum. You know, we it doesn't matter what political party you're from, you know, what group or background, you know, the air and the water are being polluted and, you know, you're going to be flooded. Your house is going to be flooded, whatever background or perspective you're from. You know, we really need to get on with the solutions. And what does system change actually look like? Jules was talking about some just there. You know, we, you know. The Copenhagen Climate Summit, just to go, because it's COP27 now, just to go back a little bit, I'm going to come over to Sue in a minute. Um, but basically, you know, our group particularly has been active since the Rio Earth Summit. Um, you know, when we went to the Copenhagen Climate Summit to film people about solutions, um, you know, there was a massive call out after the Copenhagen Climate Summit from uh, activist groups, from NGO groups, from indigenous groups to set up people's assemblies across the world because they recognized that the COP system was not working, that our global government systems are not working. And for 27 years, we've been having COPs now and our emissions and pollutions have continued to rise and rise and rise and rise. COP is not working. 
Mm. People fly in from all over the world to lecture us about climate. And, you know, what I suppose partly, or, you know, say there's something Rupert's talking about COP reform or replace. What do we replace COP with? It hasn't been working for 27 years. And, you know, people's assemblies, global, I know Jamie Kelsey Fry, if I'm previously is talking about global assemblies. And uh, when XR first started up, we were hoping to see a lot more people's assemblies happening all over the place. We can't wait round for governments to give us citizens assemblies. We're hoping that through system change of climate emergency centres, we are going to put these system changes in place and have a people's assembly every month or every two months. And it's already started Islington, values from Islington, uh, they did a, uh, um, a climate emerge, uh, a people's assembly basically on um, clean air and clean air parents and stuff and what we're going to do. So how do we reform or replace COP and how do we create this new system of system change if you actually want to see. So coming over there to Sue in Carmarthen and then Richard in, is it Hereford? Not good red. Yeah, Sue. Yeah, my, my questions, are two questions really. The first one is, um, how important do you think it is to make sure that this appears at least to be just about the local? I, I, I mean, my concern is that anything that's a big group, like even the moderate flank thing, is that it becomes something that you either have to join or, you know, belong to in some way. And, and I'm sort of thinking, listening to Jules talking about what he's doing, it's very much based on the local area and you're talking to people as a local person rather than as an activist is that is that what you're doing you, it's not you're not yeah. really seeing yourself as being part of a group you're just saying in our community this is what we yeah need so to do. i was i was trying to to um get at that earlier when i said that this new mass moderate flank is going to be very distributed right yeah. it's not going to be like extinction rebellion where it was sort of like an overarching kind of organization with sort of franchises or something it's going to be much more um there's uh, lawyers for net zero over here and there's trust the people and there's climate emergency centers and there's clean creatives and purpose disruptors and safe landing and uh, all these different organizations but then just kind of some kind of sense that they're all in some sense part of the same thing sometimes we talk about it as like a wave like a kind of new wave that's kind of the wave of course is composed of lots of lots of different bits if you will of water right so you're right what we don't want here is like a kind of a new tribe or a kind of badge that you have to be under but yeah. what we do want i think is for some sense to be made of the situation people need sense making people need to have some kind of sense of oh, this is happening um, across uh, the, the land. This is happening across uh, different um, aspects of life. And that's what I think will give people kind of uh, uh, hope and positivity that it's possible that this could all really add up to something, could even maybe add up to enough. So you're quite right. It, it's, gonna, it's gonna backfire if this is like a kind of new badge of identity. It's more something like a kind of, just a kind of sense of what's happening of what's starting to emerge. Does that help? Yeah, definitely. So so just my follow-up question to that really is then, what do you think, because obviously a lot of people in our area who are involved in this kind of thing, which we are just beginning to start in our area, are also currently kind of well-known to be activists within XR. So what do you consider to be the way that we should play that relationship? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really great uh, question. And and care is needed. You know, you have to be on the one hand, you have to be truthful. But on the other hand, you have to work carefully not to put people off. So, you know, my invitation to people who are in XR or were in XR or are in other kinds of radi uh, radical activism or whatever, is consider taking up uh, leadership roles in the in the new moderate flank. Uh, as Jules is doing, as uh, Phoenix has done, as lots of people actually have uh, have done. And whatever you do, to really try to work to make sure that it is the things we were talking about earlier, that it is genuinely inclusive, that it is genuinely welcoming, that it is open to people with, uh, with different uh, politics, that you don't have to be uh, uh, an activist, that you don't have to sort of dress a certain way to conform or whatever, you know, uh, you have to be serious about that. And that's, um, that's a bit of a, an ask for, for some of us. But I think it's a necessary one. I think it's one we can we can rise to. After all, the the cause is is worth it. Uh, and um, also, I think it's crucial as part of that to try to make sure that we are um, 
working with and appealing to and serious about kind of raising up um, people from um, demographics or other kinds of representation that have struggled in the past. So, for example, uh, one of the things that at our next moderate flank gathering that we're trying to do um, is to make sure that we've got a decent uh, number of people from working class backgrounds uh, there. Um, and I think that's actually really quite um, important. Uh, and to the extent that we succeed in doing stuff like that, we're, we've got a much better shot at becoming genuinely mass. That's, that's, all of this is just coming at a perfect moment for us here, so thank you very brilliant. much. Brilliant, brilliant. Rupert, just to facilitate a little bit there, I know you said you're checking your time. We usually run to about the hour or five past, ten past, depending on the group. And oh, that's fine, yeah. Subject tonight, are you all right to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go over five or ten minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, real good. Okay, so keep your questions or answers succinct, um, uh, panel and on the university challenge, and Rupert. So uh, Richard <laughs> one, Jules two, Jane three. Over. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say that this we're part of a much longer movement that have been fighting against some of the destruction. Um, I mean, there are about a million or so different organizations working for social justice and ecological um, change around the world. And numerically, they might even be more, more numerous in countries like Brazil and India than they are in the UK. So we shouldn't always think that we're leading on this. We're just, um, we're part of a, an emergent global movement that has no name, it has no central organization, it's bubbling up all around the world and we're all part of that and we all link in with different bits of it, but none of us knows about all of it, it's just too big for anyone to know. Um, I tried to articulate this in a book that I just put in a, a, my, a into the chat earlier on. Uh, I just just published a book about it. Anyway, um, and we've got a discussion group, which I'd like to flag up. We're having a meeting on the 22nd. And again, I put a Zoom link in there. But it very much links in with what you're doing here tonight. And, you know, I very much want to be a part of this moderate flank. But it's like with so many things, we have 100 different hats we swap between, but we're still the same people. But, you know, um, you know XR one day, Friends of the Earth another day, Moderate Flank another day, you know, Green Party another day. And it's it's you know it's all part of the the rich mix. Anyway, that's me. Yeah, thanks, Lovely. Richard. Really, really interesting. Just briefly, um, yeah, we're hoping that the the that that the new Moderate Flank that it isn't going to be just another of these things that one swaps hats. That it is going to be like I was trying to say in response to the last question. It's going to be a kind of felt sense of being something more kind of overarching and and diffuse. And it is a it is a a bold attempt to to name uh, something, which, as you say, is kind of emergent and really quite uh, diverse. Mm. But it also there's also a certain kind of specificity, I think, to this historical moment, which is what I try to capture in this perspective a piece of something new becoming possible in the wake of XR and Greta and in the context of the more than emergency, which sort of defines everything that we do now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Very good, Richard. Over to Jules uh, and then Jane. Uh, yeah, thanks, Richard. I describe it as an ecology. And as you say, there's a mycelium of all these things that are flowering in so many bits of uh, good global action. So we, we, you know, a moderate flank is an overarching approach to me. Um, and maybe transformative adaptation is a philosophy. So mm -hmm. rather membership organization or you know somewhere you're going to be zoom every week figuring out what you're going to do you know where community climate action is action in a geographic place-based community where i'm hoping that people here and others will take action um and go and write a plan is the first thing and how we how we support you know how we support doing that <clears throat> um yeah so very very much uh, ag agree with you um so hope that helps Okay, over to Jane in Sunny. Not quite sure where you are at the moment, Jane. Over. Uh, unmute if you can, Jane. Uh, yeah, done it. So I just want to share something with you that I did a few weeks ago. I think I explained to I think Phoenix and Rupert I was going to do this. It's I had a local community, I set up a local community meeting, and you know the concept of moderate flank was at the back of my mind for it. I put out posters on bus stops and things like that and in my local community centre because 
referencing what someone said earlier on, I think it was important to get a whole mix of different kinds of people to try and come along. Of course, I had no idea how many people would come and how it would go. Um, the, the reason, the sort of, the objective, I suppose, was for people to start to consider how they need to work together as community to become resilient. And I think, again, it was a result of talks I'd seen, well, I'd already decided to do it, but talks at um, Green Gathering, for example, about resilience and developing that in communities. And so working, to, trying to get people together in some more content, like most of them probably. We might have a little villages as, as a vague community, but a lot of people just don't engage with it. It's getting people to engage. And so to try and do it as a big open meeting, just as a community meeting, not, um, oh, I said is, are you worried about climate crisis and cost of living crisis? So that I hoped would bring in, you know, people from the poorer sections of the community. Unfortunately, it didn't. You know, only half of people were sort of XR people, elders mostly, I think they're the ones that came. It was just trying to get people to just figure out what they could do as community together, working together in order to become more resilient. And I think people appreciated the chance to sit and chat about that with each other. What I was hoping was that some who'd come from further away would take it and use it in their own little communities. So you get a whole range of people. It didn't quite work that way and they didn't come up with any ideas of how they could. Just one simple idea I thought of was just make sure everyone on your street is in a WhatsApp group so that you can all talk together and get to know each other and you know, be there if something happens. Uh, and particularly cost of living, making sure that the elderly folk and, and you know, single mums, et cetera, have got sufficient for their needs. So it just seemed a way of bringing everything together and trying to get community together and trying to develop resilience. I got them to look at, first of all, a vision of what they want for the future. Then, because I knew they would want to talk about what they could, um, you know, what they could do as an individual, but then what you could do as community. So three, three things were addressed. I think it went quite well, didn't quite achieve what I wanted it to achieve. I wasn't pre prepared to do anything else afterwards, not like CECs, you know, where it's a big thing. I was just wanted to bring people together. So I think I found it worthwhile. People came along and certainly found it worthwhile. So I could you know, recommend maybe doing something like that. Wonderful. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jane. Uh, Richard, was that uh, any other final questions? We're going to wind up in the next five or so minutes, folks. So Richard, was that your hand still up or another question? Unmute, Richard. No, oh, any sorry, sorry. Um, I hadn't realised I'd left my hand up. Okay. <laughs> Bell? Bell, was that... A... Okay, anyone else for any uh, final rounds up, sir? I'm just watching the screen or stick your uh, reactions fingers up easier. Okay, we're getting towards the end of the time. Just what's to say, um, you know, the Climate Emergency Centres project has come through 30 years of setting up these centres since the Rio Earth Summit. We've worked with about seven different waves of the environmental movement from the road protests to anti-war to climate justice camps on to Occupy, on to anti-fracking and reclaim the power, on to XR uh, and beyond. You know, um, there, are, there is a, I love the word move, movement ecology and there's a mycelium of many groups. And what we found is we so need the infrastructure Maybe just do a little sum up is, you know, we need the infrastructure, the physical spaces to meet. All of these movements have come to our centres over 30 years and painted banners, had meetings, repaired carnival floats and sound systems or made costumes, whatever it is. We need space to meet, discuss and to really get on with the solutions. The solutions are out there. But what's lacking is the physical space to meet, the funding, the skills and, and mainly the political will. There are thousands and thousands of solutions our movement have been talking about for 30 years, from the green gathering powered by renewable energy and you know all these kind of solutions we've been talking about for a long time. But where is the land and the spaces to do the permaculture? Where are the buildings that you can put up the renewable energy and the solutions examples? So that's what Climate Emergency Centre is about and work with as many different groups as possible and build an alliance. Part of the handbook, I've got the new version up there that's recently updated, is about building an alliance contacting 50 different possible groups in each city uh, that's in your area and build an alliance of groups can come into that building, not just one building, find a piece of land you can link to, find other buildings you can work with. So I'm gonna leave the parting uh, words to uh, Rupert on the old university challenge. Thank you very much, Rupert, for coming. And 
Thank you. Fantastic video um, and a very stimulating conversation. Let's keep this ball rolling. People get in touch with uh, Rupert and the other groups. Check out Save the Chat before we go. Uh, thank you very much, Rupert, and everyone for all your questions on the University Challenge and Climate Emergency Centre Challenge Board. Over to Rupert for uh, parting comments. Over. Thank you very much, bro. Nice well, I'll, I'll be very brief. Thanks so much, uh, Phoenix. Thanks, everybody. Thanks also, Jules, for uh, really helping me out there and yeah it's been super um let's share this stuff and let's keep this vibe going forward i felt that there was a real sort of meeting of minds in this zoom room here tonight and that's really encouraging because this is what we need because this is serious and no one's coming to rescue us and i'll just leave you with another flash because i'm very, very excited about it my new book it's the first meeting i've been able to show it at so that'll be officially launched on monday do you want to know the truth the surprising rewards of climate honesty with a sleeve endorsement from Chris Packham, no less. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Let's do it. Okay, thank you very much, Rupert. And uh, just to say, this Thursday, if you're in Southwark area, there's info on the Telegram chat. Uh, there is a Southwark climate justice meeting about setting up a, a climate emergency centre in Southwark or some South London link up groups. And on Friday, if you're near Kingston, the Kingston Hive is having its opening event. So if you can make it to Kingston this Friday, info on the Telegram chat, I'll post in the game. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming and all the, all the questions. Lovely. Keep networking wherever you are. Get a centre, take action every day. Nice, Tom. Bye-bye. Good night, all. Thank you. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 tonight. <laughs> nice on devs. <laughs> Cheers. Nice on Rupert. Lovely. Save the chat if we need. Nice job, Phoenix. Nice job chairing. Cool. I've got the word facilitator, darling, but fantastic. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> will, you be, uh, will you share the recording with us all afterwards? Yeah, I'll try and get that uh, done pretty much after this, and uh, I'll send you a link and I'll put it on the Telegram chat. Are you on the CC Telegram chat? No, I don't use Telegram much. Well done, well done. Yeah, I'm trying to cut down on platforms. They overwhelm me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to post the Telegram thing at the end of this. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll text you a, a link. I guess. All right, mate. I'm going to go now. Right. Good night. Cheers. Okay. Nice one. Thank you. Nice one, Nick. Nice one, Elizabeth. William. Danny. Jason. Oh, hi. Are you there? I'm still here, yes. I'm just going to stop recording. Uh, let me just yeah, sure. do yeah, stop sure. recording. No, I, then... I just, I've, just been, I've just been driving, so... Oh.